wonderful. So I see people are starting to join the webinar. Uh, hello and welcome back. Uh, just as usual, we're going to give it a minute or two to make sure everyone who's coming along today is inside the call before we get started with the meat of today's session. Now, as usual, if you do have any questions or you want to join in on the conversation throughout today's webinar, do please make sure to use the Q&A function and the chat box at the bottom of the Zoom call. You can use that to ask any questions you want to throughout the presentation or just have commentary with your fellow uh, attendees about what we're talking about. Lovely. So I see we have everyone jumping in. So I think we'll get started with today's session. So hello and welcome back. I'm Frederick. I'm your host for the iSpy360 webinar series. Now today is Future Friday and our session is going to be focused around 3D printed houses and whether 3D printing will become a regular part of our future. I am lucky enough to be joined today by Henrik Lund Nielsen, who is the founder and general manager of Cobod International, a globally leading company with 3D construction printing who are constantly making headlines in the construction and 3D printing press. Cobod, among other 3D printing, uh, pardon me. So Cobod, among others, 3D printed the BOD, the first building in Europe in 2017, sold the largest 3D construction printer in the world with a length of 27 meters to the Middle East and delivered the printers that 3D printed the first two story buildings in Europe, Belgium and Germany respectively. Recently, Cobod entered into a long-term collaboration agreement with GE Renewable Energy and Lafarge Holcim, the world's, the world's largest cement and concrete manufacturer for the 3D printing of record tool concrete windmill towers. Now in 2015 to 2017, as the project manager for a government supported project, Henrik led a three year research project into the global state of the art of basically 3D construction. So Henrik is a frequent speaker on 3D construction printing where he is considered to be one of the leading experts globally. So we are over the moon to have him with us in today's session. Thank you so much for joining us, Henrik. Now, to start off, I Thank wanted to just... Thank you for having me. Sorry. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. We yeah, love to have Thank you for having me. Excellent. So we want to start off with just a okay. few questions. Uh, our first question is, what, in your opinion, are the top five benefits of using 3D printing over traditional building methods? Number one, and for us, the most important is the labor saving, that uh, by letting the, the machine, the printer, do uh, the majority of the work, we are cutting down on, on labor cost. And here in Europe, labor cost is, of course, uh, the, typically the highest cost of any activity we have, and we want to cut it down as, as much as possible. Um, so with the help of automation, and because it's made by ro robotics, we, we use a fraction Because of that also, and our ability to, to operate 24-7, um, we, we have an incredible speed compared to, to normal construction. And the third one is that uh, we get complexity for free. That means that in regular construction, you prefer to have rectangular shapes, straight lines, and so on. And anytime you do something with an organic shape, it costs a, a bunch of money. Uh, for us, we don't care. The printer doesn't care whether it's printing straight lines or curved lines or whatever. Um, and then there is a, the whole row of other advantages related to the fact that you do, do automate the whole construction process. So precision, for instance, we speak about millimeters of precision. Normally in construction, you speak about centimeters. Um, a lot of the construction workers are in fact pointing at the fact that, hey, if we had this technology 20 years ago, we wouldn't have been so worn and, and torn as, as we are now, because you know there is no carrying of any materials or anything. The, the, the machine does everything automatically. So there's a whole lot of other advantages, including safety also as, as, as one of them related to the fact that it's, uh, it's being automated. Fantastic. So what are the current challenges in printing a house? Well, there is, I would say generally there are, there are two main challenges right now. So the accumulated experience 
um, and, and we have a lot of it, uh, relatively speaking, to compare to our colleagues, uh, is still quite limited. And this is a little bit like learning how to ride a bike. If you remember how it was the first time you rode a bike, in fact, you would probably more be uh, sitting than riding the bike because you would be falling all the time the first time you tried. The second time would be a little bit better, the third time again better, and the fifth time much better, and the tenth time a lot better. But we haven't done the same thing ten times yet. You know, most of what we do are one-offs. So there is accumulated very little experience, in fact. And so experience, uh, more experience needs to be gained. So that's one. Secondly, also in terms of experience, the, the permitting authorities in all countries, they are facing a challenge here because this is new and we're doing it completely different than how the building code was originally envisaged because the building code is a reflection of the conventional technology. So a lot of the solutions that we can do uh, are not allowed simply according to code because they didn't know that it could be done this way. So uh, right now we are actually adopting to the code than the other way around. But as this thing is growing and more and more uh, constructions are being made with our technology, we will see that the code will have to be adapted. But, the, but construction is a conservative industry because we, we are building buildings that last for centuries almost. So it's a slow process of adapting the, the code. So until that happens, we have to adapt to the code then the good thing is the printer is a tool. It doesn't prescribe any specific way to construct a building. You can use a lot of different construction methods. So we can uh, adopt to the code and then do something which is permittable within the code. Incredible. So then when you're building a 3D property, other than the house's main structure, what else do you need to sort of get a completed finished product? product? Well, obviously the, the shell of the, of the building, so to say, if, if you look at the foundation, the walls and, and, the, and the slab uh, is only part of, of a house. So the term that you are 3D printing a house or a building is in essence a little bit exaggerated because it is the shell mainly that, that we are focusing on. But, but one of our development projects is in fact to look at all the other things that are needed in order to complete a building. So you can think about insulation, painting, etc. Why not let the printer do that also, or, or let the robot do that also? So obviously that's that's part of, of, uh, of our development plan and something we've been working on for, for a couple of years. And then it starts getting a, a lot more complex because you talk about different tools, different materials and, and so on. Obviously also we have the special authorized uh, construction trades being plumbing and wiring. Um, and, and there we also trying to get the printer to help with as much as possible of that. So we don't need these special um, uh, guys with an authority uh, to do uh, on a permit to do these kind of jobs because they are ex especially expensive and we want to get rid of the expensive labor, right? Definitely. So when you are printing a house, could any design be used to do it? Or can a larger printer only print certain kinds of shapes and structures? Well, in essence, uh, we have the advantage of, of having this uh, complexity for free, uh, but obviously you, you can design things that, that uh, physically are possible. So if you follow my line here, if you try to build something that, that stood up like that, no structure will do that. It will fall down then, right? Because of gravity. So, so there are still uh, certain limitations uh, in terms of how much you can make the, the, the walls, for instance, lean uh, over. So there is a certain degree that we generally recommend people to stay within. And also we have some limitations in terms of the size. So the, the maximum width right now is 15 meters and the maximum height is 10 meters. Uh, but in the lengths, you can go as long as you like. Uh, these two limitations, 15 meters in the width and 10 meters in the height, are obviously also things that we are looking at expanding. So within a year, I wouldn't be surprised if we are doing 20 meters in the width and 20 meters in the height also. And that means then suddenly we can do six story buildings. So even bigger and better buildings.
Excellent. So our next question is, could anyone design their own home and print it? Oh, Henrik, are you still there? I think I may have lost you briefly. No, I, I'm there, but but I yeah, there was something with the connection. So if you can repeat. Yes, of course. So could anyone design their own home and print it? In, 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 in theory, yes, if you take uh, any uh, CAD software and design something, uh, you, you could print it afterwards straight from that CAD file. However, as always, uh, you can also today uh, draw something up in, in CAD and then try to make it. But the, the, the standard procedure is, of course, to get an architect who understands buildings, to get them involved, and then a structural engineer for the structural soundness of what it is that you're drawing. And, and, and our process is not different than that, that uh, we recommend that an architect is involved. And for sure, we recommend that a stu structural engineer is, is involved. And in any event, in most countries, you need a structural engineer to sign off on your drawings in order to get a permit. So looking forward to the future, where do you see 3D printing going in the next 15 years? It's going to be a lot different than, than, than what we know of today. So as I spoke about before, the, the, the printer or the robot will be able to do a, a lot more of the, of the construction. So again, things like insulation, painting, sanding, uh, maybe putting tiles on also, et cetera. So uh, in terms of the complexity of the task that the robot, robot can handle, that will be expanded quite a lot. Uh, and also in terms of, of size. Uh, and as I said, uh, in essence, we're already now working on making a printer that is 20 meters in, in the height. And last three years, I mean, by 22, it'll probably be 25 meters and so on. So it's really hard to predict where we will be in 15 years, but it'll be a lot different, I'm sure about that. And then looking at 3D printing as an industry, do you think it's best suited to the developed Western world or could it be used anywhere in third world countries as well as the West? Well, we've had a, a, a few surprises this year because uh, in essence, uh, Africa and the US uh, are our biggest single markets if we look at Africa as one market. And, and that was uh, somewhat of a surprise. Uh, and here they're going for the skills that are built into the, 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 the robot or the printer that in essence, because of the skill that has been built into the software and so on, they, they do not require the, to have so much skilled labor and skilled labor is really uh, something that uh, is quite scarce in, in Africa. And then they're looking at speed also, speed of execution because we can, we can do the constructions much faster. Uh, that was one surprise. Uh, so in that sense, as much the developing world as the developed world. And also the precast guys, the ones that, that like to make uh, concrete and molds and factories, uh, they have also started buying our printers because they can then give shape precast elements that they cannot do today. Uh, so they get some of the flexibility that we also have. Although in, 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 in from the origin, our printers were designed to be used on site and make the entire building on site. But uh, as I said, we've also now started selling into precast uh, factories. Fantastic. So that sort of concludes my questions for now, but I believe we're now going to go into your presentation. Um, so everyone watching, we're just going to get the screen share set up. Um, but if you do have any questions during uh, the presentation, do please feel free to ask them uh, in the Q&A box below. Hello, my name is Henrik Lund Nielsen. I am the general manager and founder of Cobot. I've been asked to do a presentation. I will do a presentation called From Research of State of the Art to Becoming State of the Art. Because the start of our journey into construction printing was in fact research of state of the art. And today, without any modesty, I want to claim that we are, have, have ourselves become state of the art and I will document that to you during this presentation. As I said, our start of the 
the journey into construction printing was a three-year research program under the Danish government, under a grant. And we did it together with NCC, the largest construction company in Denmark. Uh, our background was that we were 3D printing experts, and hence we needed also to have some construction experts join into this research. We went around the whole world. We visited 38 different companies and organizations, including universities, doing projects within construction printing. Um, the research took three years. We ended up holding two international conferences and writing a 108 pages report, the only report that has been written uh, about this uh, new industry so far. And um, there were four important conclusions uh, based on that research. Number one, which is quite negative, is that 95 to 98% of all the published PR are at best misleading. So in other words, more or less everything that you have ever read about 3D construction printing is unfortunately not the entire truth. It's a very, very polished version or misleaded led version of the truth. And I'll give you a few examples of that. So if you look at the picture, um, starting the sequence of pictures here, where it's the, showing the office of the future in Dubai with the shaykh standing in front of it, it was claimed that uh, this was 3D printed in Dubai. Um, this is unfortunately not the case. What was really 3D printed was shown in the next picture, which is basically a concrete shell, as you can see here, and the shell consisting of two parts, as you see on this picture, a lower part and an upper part, and they were printed the reverse way, so they're printed upside down, uh, and then put together to form the shell. So these two pieces were sent from Tzuchou in China, where it was printed, and then manual labor did all the other interesting stuff. So at best, it's very misleading to say that this building was 3D printed in Dubai. Same thing when it comes to this building, the orange building in the middle, um, it was claimed that it was 3D printed in 24 hours um, and for only a few thousand dollars. And unfortunately, that was also not the case. Um, what was the truth was that they, during a three-day event in October 2016, so four months before, they wanted to 3D print the building during a three-day event. And what you see here is the status after the first three days. And four months later, they come out and they say that we have just 3D printed the first building in Russia and we have made a technology that can 3D print a building in 24 hours. So in essence, they didn't say that they 3D printed it in 24 hours, which was also not the case. They said that they had developed a technology that could. And yes, potentially it could, but, but uh, it, it didn't. Same thing with the icon from the US that had to, let's say, beat the Russians. They had to show that they were even better. So they said that they also printed a building in 24 hours at a cost of less than $10,000. The only problem is that they issued a video where you can actually see consecutive nights and days. So here you have the first day, here you have the, the first or even the second uh, night, and then you see a new print uh, the next day where this third or, or more nights. So in other words, it, it went over multiple days. If you know a little bit about concrete, you also know that it changes color as it uh, increases its age. So in essence, every day will, will be a new color. And you can clearly here see that there are four days and that maybe represent 80 centimeters. So again, at first, very misleading. And the other result was also quite negative, result number two, which was that the research showed that the technological level of the 3D printers used was really not impressive. And, and we're saying that as 3D printing experts, uh, when we were looking at the technological level of the printers applied, it was really quite basic and something that in the ordinary 3D printing world had been known for years. Um, so there were there were two conclusions out of number one and two, and, and the first one has to do with the effect of this uh, press releases of the PR that had been done, and that had led to unrealistic expectations from the customers. So we are still fighting with that today. We are trying to bring people down to earth to, to explain to them what can really be done. On the other hand, and this is a good thing with the PR that was done, is that the whole world is speaking about this technology. So we have customers from all continents. We speak with 
seven continents almost every week from Japan in one end and Australia down to Chile in, at, at the other end. Uh, 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 and of course, Middle East, Africa, Europe and, and US also. Um, and the other conclusion was that, well, hang on, when the technological level of the research that was put in was not very impressive, there would be lots of potential, on the other hand, if you could apply real proper 3D printing technology at a high level. So in essence, that's what we decided to do. We took the decision in March 2017, and then by September 2017, six months after, we'd done the first printer, we found a site, we made a design, and we got it, the building permitted. And then we began printing. And typically for us, we did it uh, very public. Um, so we invited a lot of guests, hence there was Sean Payne. This is the former mayor of Copenhagen opening the site. Here you see all the spectators. And here you see the, the, the printing happening. And it was ap actually happening in front of live cameras from three national television stations. And here you see the finished building. We made lots and lots of mistakes. The print took two months, um, but uh, nonetheless, it was the first 3D printed building in Europe. That meant too that people asked us both to do projects, but we are not a, we are not a construction company. We are a technology provider. So we said no to doing projects, but then they asked us to sell them the printer. But we felt that, hey, even if it was state of the art, that printer, when we made it, we could make it much better. So we decided to do that. So we spent another 10 months on developing our second generation printer, the Bot 2, which was then launched in July 18. In October 18, then uh, Perry, uh, which is a global leader in formworks equipment, uh, which is in essence is the manual competitor to, competitor to what we do. When you want to cast concrete on site, you can either choose to have formworks that gives shape to the concrete, or you can use a 3D printer. Now, formworks is very, very manual work. And you can say when the biggest manual competitor is deciding to invest in the leading uh, automatic uh, uh, competitor, which is us, it's a little bit like saying, if you cannot beat them, then join them. And so German Perry decided to do that. Um, then following that we had done the bot 2, we began supplying out the first printers in January and April. And that was after that uh, two European tenders had been made where we were competing with all the established guys that had been doing printers and been researching into this area much longer than us. Uh, and we won towards uh, in both competitions. And then by July 19, we supplied the largest printer so far, construction printer so far in the world. And I'll show you a video of it here. Um, please notice the van uh, that appears on the lower left-hand side of your screen now. And you will see that this is a very impressive printer. It is 27 meters long. So 27 meters long. It is uh, 12 meters across. And it is 10 meters tall. And you can also see the quality of the parts that are being supplied. This is not a hobby machine or a toy printer. This is heavy duty industrial equipment for on-site 3D construction printing. And the, and the equipment is made to last for years and years like any other construction equipment. Then by August, we uh, proved also that we were highly competitive. So we won a, a, what will be an iconic project for EMAR and if you are unfamiliar with EMAR, I think I can uh, explain their role in, in Dubai and the Middle East by saying they're also, EMAR is also behind the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa, and also uh, behind the seven-star hotel, the Burj Al Arab. So EMAR is, in essence, the real estate uh, agent for, for the Sheikh and, and his visions. And um, they designed this building that you can see on the picture. And we won uh, the, the project for delivering the technology to enable them to make this uh, building. It has not been made public yet. We are expecting that to happen, to happen soon. Then by September, we decided that we had improved so much. And with the BOT2, we have a much better technology than the BOT1. So we said, why don't we try it again? We simply reprint, we copy print the, the building that we did in 2017. So we make a complete copy of your 3D printed building. We just do it inside uh, a warehouse. And we did that. 
as I said, the first time we did it, it took two months. The second time we did it, it took 28 and a half hours. Really documented the massive improvements in the technology and in just the fact that we were more experienced. As you will see, there is a timer at the bottom of the screen because typically for us, we document everything that, that we say. Uh, uh, so these are unedited video footings, as you can see on the, on the timer, uh, documenting how fast we did the print. And here you see this key statistics uh, related to that printing, which are also documented. Um, we are in Denmark, and in Denmark it's quite easy to get grants for, for, for innovative companies like ours, ours. So we got actually a grant for developing the next generation printer, so the part three, which we have been doing now for almost two years. And we're doing it with the lead, leading technological and robot universities of Denmark and also the leading architectural companies. And the idea about the next generation is, is uh, both to have it on tracks, which makes it possible to print uh, buildings of uh, unlimited length, and also to have it as multifunctional tools. Um, so this printer, and it might not even be correct anymore to call it a printer, the BUD3, this uh, construction robot, multifunctional construction robot, will do much more than just printing of concrete. Think about insulating the building, think about painting the building, et cetera, et cetera. Then by October, we uh, did see the first result of our long-term cooperation with American GE and French Lafarge. And uh, GE, I think everybody knows, but Lafarge is the world's biggest concrete and cement maker, and also a very impressive company. And together with them, we, we took it upon us to, to 3D print the first ever windmill tower. And you see the printing uh, going on here. The most interesting things happen when we are at the height, because there you will very much, very clearly see that the printer is fully automated. There is no people involved. And it's just going around, in this case, at a height of almost uh, 10 meters, printing the tower. And here you see the final tower. Then by November, our Belgium customer, our first Belgium customer, uh, began the 3D printing and finished the 3D printing of Europe's first two-story building. And we will see a video of that now. The interesting thing about this print is that it's actually printed by students. So we gave training to certain students and these two students taught the other students of how to use the printer. And so uh, it, that shows that even if it's complex technology, it is not that difficult to master. And here you see the, the final building, Europe's first two-story 3D printed building. Then uh, by December, we proved the extreme fast execution time we have from uh, actually getting a drawing until uh, making a building. We had a visit for, from some com companies from abroad and they showed us a drawing and I asked them to send me the drawing and then I sent the drawing out to our printing guys and three and a half hours later we went out to the warehouse and we, we showed them the first one meter of their building which of course was very impressive. Then uh, we got the first orders from uh, the US at the end of uh, 2019 so supplying printers to Florida and Texas and we ended our uh, First, uh, well, our second year of operation by being profitable, which in itself is a very remarkable result. Then by February, we also wanted to prove that this is a very uh, reliable technology. It's basically uh, uh, a plug-in uh, ready to go. So we decided together with Perry that we should print a building, one building per day during four days at a live exhibition. So. Uh, this has never been done before, uh, but we were confident that our technology was reliable enough to do it. And you see the actual printing, printing happening here. If you wonder what it is that is in the middle of the building, it's actually the, the logo of the exhibition, 
they became so fascinated by the fact that we could convert things uh, that fast into real life. Um, and you see the uh, extreme amount of visitors uh, being present. Uh, obviously, this was the talk of the town during this uh, exhibition that we were printing a building uh, every day. So I'll finish this video now because I think a more detailed video will be more telling for you. So here's a version of that. And you can, this video shows the effect of using flaps. So flaps are the, the small metal things that comes down on the side of the printhead. You see them here. And you can see how smooth the wall is becoming. We didn't use flaps here. We started using flaps here to show the effect. And you can see it becomes extremely smooth and very easy to plaster or just to paint uh, and then let that be the, the finish. You can also clearly see it here from the from the front side, how, how good the uh, finishing quality is when you use flaps. And again, you notice the amount of people with cameras taking videos, etc., etc. This was obviously very, very interesting for the majority of the visitors. Then uh, by March, we started getting our first orders from, X, uh, from, from Africa. So we actually received and delivered uh, two printers to Africa. And by May this year, we sold our first uh, printer into a precast plant that was sold by, by Perry. And precast is when you, when you don't want to do concrete on site, but want to do it off site in molds, in factories, it's called precast. But the molds uh, have the disadvantage that you can't change them and you cannot give organic forms to them. It's very difficult to do curves, etc. So they wanted to have a printer exactly because of that flexibility that uh, our printer provides. Then here in September, uh, Perry revealed uh, the first uh, two-story building in Germany, actually the first 3D printed building in Germany and will become a, a, a two-story building also. They decided not to use flaps because they deliberately wanted to show that it was 3D printed um, because that's attractive right now, that look to, uh, to certain people. Uh, we generally print with flaps, but a lot of our customers uh, cho choose not to print with flaps because they want to show that it's really 3D printed. Now, when you evaluate the potential of 3D construction printing, you have to take into consideration the experience of the people that have used the technology, because it's quite like riding a bike the first time. If you, if you remember how it was when you learned how to bike, well, you're probably actually falling and sitting down more than you were riding the bike. That is just how it is when you do things for the first time. That's the same thing for us when we did the bot building. It took two months of print, and basically most of the time we were standing still. Now, the second time you, you tried to ride the bike, you were still insecure, but you were falling way less and you were riding much more. That's the same thing. When we did the copy bot building, we, we were actually only using 28 hours instead of two months. Now, if you were doing by the fifth time uh, riding the bike, you would mainly be riding. You would stop falling, etc. And that means that if we did the bot building again or similar type building again, we believe we would be down to eight or 10 hours. And by the 10 times, you would be riding fast and we believe that we could actually do the bot building in just four or five hours with that kind of experience. So this thing also has to do with uh, two facts of uh, uh, economic uh, concepts, which is economics, economics of scales and learn an effect. And right now there are no economics of scale because every project is a one-off and there is very, very little experience because even us, we have only printed a very few buildings. But once we get more experienced, as shown here, and once we get the learning effect and the economics of scale, we are capable of bringing the printing cost and the building cost from up this level down to this level, and then we can really disrupt the construction sector. And this is happening by itself, automatically, as we get more and more experienced. Here's a reminder, as a concluding remarks. You see here a, a picture of my first laptop and I was the big dog because and this is back from 83 as uh, so when I was 18 years old and entered into business school because my laptop had two floppy disks of 128 kilobytes each that means by today's standard I could write an email with hi and bye 
and then I would be out of memory. Now, just a few years later, I went to study in the US to take my MBA, and I brought this, which is a compact portable laptop in 89. And you see the gigantic improvement that happened from here to here. And then if we look at further improvements, you've got the MacBook Air in 2010, but it was a much more limited development after that. Basically, already in 89, we got a laptop that is very similar to the laptops that we are using today. Massively different from, from, from 83, and really from there on, more like marginal improvements only. Now, quite a few people, at least of the younger people, they, they wouldn't know what this is, but this was a, a portable mobile phone uh, uh, back in the 90s. It weighed 25 kilos, it cost 5,000 euros, and it was really, really bad as a phone. But look what happened. Just six years later, we got the first mass market mobile phone, the Nokia phone. And then again, we saw uh, uh, the development in 2007 on, onto the technology that we basically know today with the, with the iPhone. Again, we see massive improvement from here to here, and then more marginal from there to there. So this has to do with uh, the normal uh, technology development, which is very known and is taught at every university. You have the how much effort has been put into to a certain uh, technology, and here you have how good it is, and it develops through S curves. So the a given technology will always reach a limit to how much it can perform, and then another technology comes along that might start worse off, but then very very fast will overtake the 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 previous technology. And we think this is, in fact, very indicative of what is happening as we speak in 3D construction printing. That's why we are around here on these curves. Um, in other words, if I have to point at where are we in terms of how close are we to having these mass market uh, products, I would say we are somewhere here. So very, very close. And we will disrupt the construction industry because of the massive improvements in performance that our experience and new solutions will bring. And by this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Brilliant. So I see, uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Henrik. It was absolutely wonderful. I see we've had lots of questions sent in uh, by our audience. So would it be all right to go through a few of those with you? Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. So our first question is, can you use recyclable materials for 3D printing? Yes, that is indeed possible. Actually, when we did the bot building, we deliberately wanted to show that. So we used recycled tiles, ceiling tiles, uh, or roof tiles. So uh, actually a red material, and uh, that made up 23% of the concrete. Wow, that's incredible. So it's really sort of, you're also looking with that eco-friendly approach uh, when you're creating these properties. Yeah, as I said during my presentation, normally we get grants uh, pretty easy here in Denmark, and we, we did apply for another grant, which unfortunately we didn't get together with Lafarge, where we were trying to, we wanted to try to make a concrete with 75% recycled materials. Wow, that would be absolutely incredible. Um, so our next question is for you, what was the hardest part of setting up Cobot? Well, as a startup, it's, it's uh, capital uh, is, is always an issue and you don't get capital before you have some track record. Mm. Um, so in essence, that was the same thing as us. And so at a certain point, you have to take a bold decision to try to get some track record. And obviously what you do normally is you, you put out a, a product in the market, but we were not convinced that we could do that. So instead we took it upon ourselves to 3D print Europe's first building. And after that, then we had investors calling us, not the other way around. Which is exactly how you want it to be. Uh, it's a preferable situation. Let me put it this way, yes. Wonderful. Um, so our next question is, how much does a 3D printed home cost? Well, that all depends on what market you're in because the construction markets are, are very local. That means you are uh, relying on the local cost of labor the legal, local cost of materials and the building code and the building styles that you have. So there's not one answer to that. There's 200 answers to that, uh, one by each country, so to say. And even within that country, you can you can do a lower spec house, sort of, sort of a, an affordable uh, uh, housing type, 
or you could do a luxurious type. Uh, so there are 600 different answers as a minimum to that question. Brilliant. Um, so someone has asked in our audience, has COVID-19 affected your day-to-day -day work? Yes, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, negatively in the sense that uh, this technology is a, a lot like uh, seeing is believing. Mm -hmm. So in essence, uh, before COVID, we, we didn't sell a printer to somebody that hadn't been to see us, felt a printer, seen the quality of, of the print, seen the quality of the printer itself. Um, and uh, we started out the year very, very strong. Uh, we're selling a lot more than what we did the, the year before. Then because of COVID and nobody could come, we sort of had a break in our order intake, but now our orders have started to flow back and now we're getting orders from people that actually haven't been here. But to a certain extent, they are of course perceiving that the risk is even higher now than, than they perceived it before because now they can't come and see and verify for themselves. Uh, well, at least it's not that easy to come anymore. Yes, no, I see. And our final question for today, which I think is really sort of exciting idea, is could 3D printed tech be used on the moon or Mars? Yes, uh, in, in, in theory, it's, it's something that our, some of our colleagues are focused on. We are absolutely not focused on it. Why the hell, sorry my language, should we bother about the moon? and do, uh, you know, one house, one there. I mean, it's, uh, it's one printer and I sell printers every month. So, you know, I focus on the, the market I have just in front of me. So uh, to me, that makes much more business sense. Yeah, so you won't be calling Elon Musk up very soon. No, I have no interest whatsoever. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Henrik. It's been a okay. really sort of insightful presentation. Um, and I think both myself and our audience have learned so much more about what 3D printing is and how it sort of operates. So thank you for joining me. Very good. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. So for everyone watching, uh, that concludes this week's Future Friday session. We will be back next week on Tuesday for our Tips Tuesday session. And that will again be at five o'clock UK time on Tuesday. So that's also 9 a.m. Pacific time in the U.S. Once again, thank you so much for coming along. Do please stay safe and stay healthy out there and have a really wonderful weekend. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.